Los Cabo Verde de Esperanza Esperanza en un día no puede bien vivir de ti Esperanza en un día todo puede voltar Porque para no estar Va a vivir en no estar Volta para no estar a Cabo Verde Volta para la tierra que de nos Volta para no estar a Cabo Verde Frankly, I could DJ music all um, all day long, and we could just have an hour of of that. But um, since we did talk about this being uh, my uh, chance to give a report back, um, I'll keep it at five minutes. And uh, just want to say greetings to all of you. Um, I'm going to try to talk for about uh, maybe half of the time. Uh, till around 5.30 uh, Eastern time, and then open it up to some comments and questions. Um, I guess the main thing uh, I wanna say uh, is that this is not a comprehensive objective report of international affairs in December of 2022. This is a personal and subjective report of my travels in this time period, um, given who I am and where I went. So let's just start with that. Um, since most of you are comrades and friends, uh, it's just an honor and pleasure to have 
me uh, be given this chance by my collective resistance in Brooklyn to uh, to give a little report back uh, at a certain point RB, which has been going on for uh, now a little over 30 years strong, uh, said, you know, we want to hear about all this traveling you do. And other comrades in Spirit of Mandela said the same. It's like, okay, let's make this a, a slightly more public uh, spot. And people know that in addition to my work in the States, uh, in RB and Spirit of Mandela and other formations. Uh, I'm also the Secretary General of the International Peace Research Association, which is the uh, oldest and uh, in some ways largest and most formidable of the consortiums of peace researchers, university-based professors, K through 12 peace educators and activist organizers. So, um, in that position that I've been holding for several years as their CEO, as their Secretary General, um, I was able to make up for lost time, make up for a, a period, of course, during COVID when uh, most of our travels were stopped. And, uh, and then for the last six months or so, do extensive travels in this period, mainly to Europe and Africa, uh, to over two dozen countries, uh, throughout both of those continents. Um, I think the first important thing for me to say is that this in no way denigrates some of the work going on in other places. Um, you know, it's not always that I have my druthers exactly where I want to go to. Uh, certainly in Latin America, we have extraordinary and unbelievably important and significant happenings taking place. And I'm excited that uh, my 2023 schedule will take me uh, to at least some uh, major parts in Latin America and the Caribbean. But in, in these two continents, in addition to one particular series of projects taking place in Juba, South Sudan, that I've been working on for well over three years, and in some ways someone cited it, one of my South Sudanese comrades said, you know, we've been really thinking about this for 16 years. So this is a culmination of decades of Pan-African work I've been doing. Um, it also, my travels and these spots I was in also corresponded to two major uh, regional and continental conferences of the two regional associations that are attached to IPRA, the European Peace Research Association, which took place in June in Finland, and the African Peace Research and Education Association Conference, which took place in Juba uh, in November last month. So those were two of the occasions for me to do speaking tours, preliminary and post-conference trips throughout those two continents. And I guess I'll say, and by the way, I noticed that some of you already began, it's always a good practice to, um, to put into the chat who you are, uh, because not all, even though I know, I think all of you, not all of you know one another. And yes, if you have, uh, some particular uh, comments or questions, you can put them in now. Although I don't always multitask the reading of things and speaking of things uh, at the same time. There will be, as I say, after about 20 minute, more minutes of listening to me talk, there'll be, um, there'll be time for questions and comments and answers. So two continents and two major messages. Uh, in Europe, uh, the main message I had was decolonization and what decolonization needs to mean at this moment for the 21st century. And decolonization of necessity means different things for different peoples. But to travel through Europe, especially talking to European professors and students, uh, including many, many PhD students, about what 21st century colonialism still means and still look like, both in the form of the direct colonies that still exist in the world, like Puerto Rico, like Western Sahara, and I'll name others later uh, in a few minutes, but also neo-colonialism, and also what we in the US, you know, uh, have referred to for a while as internal colonialism, what it means to have uh, half of Mexico, uh, all of a sudden, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo called U.S. Oh, you're no longer in Mexico. You're in the U.S. now because of a, a, a war and a border dispute and a victor and to the victor comes the spoils. 
what does the Black nation in the U.S. mean? What does New Africa mean for 2023, 2024, and beyond? So looking at questions of direct colonialism, neo-colonialism, um, internal colonialism, these all are significant parts of the decolonizing message that I try to bring forth uh, in my talks, especially throughout Europe. Um, making the links to also say that decolonization has to do with our minds as well. And so decolonizing our minds, decolonizing our fields of study, peace studies uh, as a discipline has been like so many others, too Eurocentric, too Euro-American centric. So what does it mean to look at our research and our studies from decolonial perspectives. And then of course, finally, if we're gonna decolonize our minds, if we're gonna decolonize the nation states and the peoples, if we're gonna decolonize uh, our ways of thinking, we have to decolonize our organizations as well. And what that practically means in each of our organizations, whether it's a small collective in New York or a global organization like International Peace Research Association, what decolonization means is real, is practical, and has to be looked at head on. I, I have to say, um, I am uh, one of one of the honors I have of being Secretary General of International Peace Research Association is that I think it primarily is not so much so a Eurocentric or Euro-American centric organization as many are. Um, the fact that I was um, elected Sec General. Uh, was in some ways an aberration. We have had African and Latin American and Asian secretary generals in our history. We have uh, both uh, rules, constitutional rules, about the composition of our council. That means we are always global majority South, and we are always at least gender parity in terms of male and female leadership. So having a, a white dude that looks like me uh, is a bit of an aberration, but um, I, I was honored that people- uh, <laughs> Yeah, Jewish is a day as long too. <laughs> no question. Right. I thought I had muted all the comments. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm 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 so very very white. Thank you, Larry, for that. But the fact is, hopefully, I have a a, a politics that's put forward uh, that that challenges some of our, our, my white sisters and brothers. Uh, so that was the big message for Europe. In Africa, the big message was um, Pan Africanism the need to revitalize and rebuild uh, Pan-African unity and Pan-African movements, and to look at Pan-African power. Uh, again, from a US perspective, we talk about free the land, uh, but what the land means in terms of African power, who controls it economically and otherwise is an ongoing question and an ongoing struggle. And so being uh, in Africa primarily as a solidarity agent, not as a leader, but as a student, and as someone who, uh, as a leader internationally, can say, we have to be listening to and following the leadership of our African sisters and brothers uh, that have been, in fact, leading the work for decades, but not always acknowledged and not always given the resources or allowed to use their own resources in ways that are appropriate if we were to truly be deep internationalists and deep internationalists that understand that a pan Africanism is in fact a remedy to all of the world's evils, to all of the isms and oppressions that we struggle against uh, in all of our work. So um, that's the scope of the two continents and the many trips. I'm gonna go into a few specifics in my, uh, in my next 15 minutes, uh, but I, I will say um, that, that some of these themes uh, were dealt with uh, in in my new book. Uh, and I saw that uh, one of you said, oh, I'd like you to talk about your, your new book. So yeah, I, I have it here as a prop. Uh, so in fact, yes, um, the book I'm very proud to have co-edited with my long-term sister and, uh, and uh, Black liberation uh, feminist here in the States, Wendy Marshall, uh, Insurrectionary Uprisings. And and we talked about revolutionary nonviolence as a way of saying uh, not so much nonviolence as revolution and understanding that revolution uh, can take armed and un unarmed forms, but cannot take any form that looks like colonialism. So decolonization, a decolonizing reader uh, is what we hope this to be. 
and uh, I can say a little bit more about that. Um, I, I also wanted to note, uh, and I'm going to see if I can uh, do a, 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 a proper job of showing screen shares in, in, in ways that make sense, but decolonizing peace studies, decolonizing the field of peace studies uh, is actually uh, the title of an essay I wrote in this past year, and that was just published last month. In the first issue, it's a 400 page issue of an academic journal called the Journal of Peace Studies in China. And so this is a new Chinese journal. Uh, I, I put it out here both because I'm proud of it, like I'm proud of the, 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 book, the other book I just put up there, but also because I think that the conversation about China uh, in the US left and in general uh, is completely inappropriate. Um, we seem to try to line up to be defenders of China as a, a, a significant force against imperialism or as um, critics of China that say, well, obviously they're state capitalists and can do no good. And in fact, no country that size, no struggle that complex can be either one or the other. We live in a world that has fewer heroes that are also presidents than we used to. Some of you, me when I was a very young, young man, uh, grew up in a time when we could look to, oh, I don't know, Ho Chi Minh uh, as a hero who was also a, a state leader. Well, there are very few heads of state, if any, that we can look to with that acclaim at this moment. So what do we need to do to say China is all good or all evil? More important to understand that there are lots of lots of Chinese people in struggle, including the producers of that journal, um, that are part of a shift uh, to challenge imperialism and challenge the greatest threat to peace and justice in the world today, which I tend to still think is US imperialism, um, without necessarily saying that the Chinese uh, state is, uh, is the model for all good things in the world today. So let's look at things and peoples more complexly than we do. Um, I'll also say uh, when, when um, holding up books, and these are the last books I'll hold up, that, uh, that two, two books that were celebrated in, uh, in Juba in South Sudan uh, were also two books that I played a, a role in co-editor of this book, which is a primer in peace studies that was uh, published by uh, our friends in Nigeria, the University of Ibadan Press. And this um, book, The Greatest Leader in the World, uh, written by a, a dear friend and former student of mine, Rudolf Nsang, from uh, Cameroon, but really from Ambazonia, from the English-speaking uh, part of Cameroon that is struggling for its own independence and sovereignty and freedom. So these are two books um, that were spotlighted in Africa. Um, let me get to a few specifics. I've got 11 minutes. All right. Um, and again, there'll be time for more specifics in Q&A. But basically, um, I'll say that there were a few notes um, about my time in Europe that I think are worth sharing. I started the time with my first visit ever to what people call Spain. Um, but uh, I, I wanna call what I was taught to call it early in my political development, state of Spain, uh, because of course Spain itself uh, is a space that has internal colonies. And as our dear sister Paulette, who's here has taught us also, and as Jalil uh, also um, went in deep with uh, recently, um, State of Spain holds uh, entire peoples as internal colonies, the Basque people most especially, but also the people of, of Catalan and other regions. And, and of course the Basque struggle uh, has done particular work in uniting with us in solidarity and support with US political prisoners. And we through Paulette, Jalil and others back at them with building an anti-imperialist movement in support of the freedom of all political prisoners everywhere. So getting to go to Spain, getting to go to Basque country, go, getting to go to Catalan was the beginning of my European tour and a very grounding space for it. Going to the European Peace Research Association conference actually was a, a, a happy making surprise. It was in the far north in Scandinavia, it was held in the northern part of Finland and then I traveled to 
Norway as well. And though in many ways, peace studies has as a international discipline about 70 years old, taken hold in those Scandinavian countries. What I found in Finland uh, in June was an entire new generation of younger European peace scholars who literally took over the organization. The council at the end of the conference was completely different generationally and politically than at the beginning. And though this was no deep struggle or coup d'etat, the elders were ready to let it go on. I am much, much more excited about working with the European Peace Research Association going forward because of their general acceptance of, understanding of, and commitment to this decolonizing solidarity perspective. So I'll be probably talking more about work we can do with the European peace researchers than I was these last years because of what happened in June. Uh, I also spent some time, I should say, in Germany, both in Vecha, in the center of the country, but also in Berlin. And for those of you longtime r and I spent some great time with John Goetz, uh, a former member of our, our Brooklyn Collective, uh, who is still one of the great investigative reporters and journalists in uh, Germany, living in East Berlin, uh, which is a regional uh, designation, but uh, he still very much understands that it means something politically. Uh, and then finally, um, a, a different trip uh, taken in August uh, to several countries in Eastern Europe. And I want to say one thing as we leave Europe and then get to the, the last part of my report uh, about the Africa work, some specifics about the Africa work. In Eastern Europe, one of the most challenging and complicated parts of that, that section of my travels was confronting the still deep and intense anti-communism that exists there uh, for reasons perhaps different than some of the anti-communism we're used to here in the US. Um, The confrontation that those peoples had with the communist regimes was not just an anti-Marxism or anti the theory of communism. It was also an anti-authoritarianism an um, anti-totalitarianism, an anti-corruption that they faced in their real lives in the ways in which Marxism was um, brought about in those countries of Eastern Europe. So I think if we look at Eastern Europe now, and there are a few sites, uh, especially with the Russian-Ukrainian conflict that have just a very, very few that have begun to look at these things in ways that I think are even-handed, are reasonable, are not anti-communist in theory, are open to Marxist and post-Marxist ideas, but understand the totalitarianism and authoritarianism that wreak havoc with those peoples and those countries, then I think we have a different type of anti-communism and a different need to look at Eastern Europe in different ways than we have before. All right, I'm gonna, these are really quick sweeping overviews, but now I'm gonna quickly move uh, to Africa. And uh, I spoke about working under the leadership of African peoples. My main work was working uh, with comrades I've had in um, South Sudan for years. The vision was that we were going to put together uh, a series of meetings that lasted for three or more weeks that brought both the African Peace Research Association, as well as independent Pan-African radicals, as well as the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, one of the peace groups I've worked with for years, but they had never had a major council in Africa, over a hundred years old. And they agreed some years ago to have their first one here, this month, this last month in Juba in South Sudan, So we put these three things together. A week of work with the peace researchers to start, a week in the middle with the Pan-Africans and independent radicals, and then at the end, international FOR. And we did this, the South Sudanese and I, intentionally to get an increase in networking and conversations among radicals around the world with an African focus. I am going to have this next section Um, involves some showing of photos. If I can get the technology to work. Okay, that looks like maybe it's working. 
Now all I have to do is be able to, oh my God, I'm even able to move the photos. So I'm gonna go through these quickly and try to end in five minutes as I promised, open for Q and A. Um, but we started, uh, I had been uh, to Brazzaville, to Congo uh, before this in, in preparation, but uh, this, this first photo is at the very beginnings of the meetings. You'll see the big sign in back. Uh, there were four real major sponsors of the three weeks, IPRA, my organization, International FOR, my head is uh, uh, over the IFO, but you see the R. ONAD is a South Sudanese organization that, that put it all together. And this gentleman to the right of your screen is the primate, the Episcopal Archbishop of South Sudan and the, uh, the South Sudanese uh, Episcopal Church uh, sponsored or co-sponsored or hosted much of our work which we knew would both involve some compromises. We weren't working under their thumb in any ways, uh, but you know they, they were involved. The Archbishop was at several different events of ours. And uh, we also knew that that meant that we could get away with some things and mainly get people there that would not have been able to get there otherwise. So this is myself and in the middle, my sister, my dear Burundian sister, Elavi Endura, that's a book the two of us uh, edited years ago on Pan-African peace building that we were gifting him. So this is the beginning gathering of, of comrades. Uh, we had people from the Sudanese parliament and people from radical grassroots parts. And of course, people from all over the continent, English, French, um, Arabic speaking, and of course, many, many African languages. One of the first things we did together and one of our, our early key guests, the man to the left of the screen now, is the grandson of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, we really uh, wanted to, uh, coming up now a few weeks away on the one year anniversary of uh, Archbishop Tutu's passing, uh, hold some homage uh, to this leader who has worked so hard for his whole life on the liberation of all peoples, including our US political prisoners. So his uh, daughter couldn't make it. She sent a video message uh, and, and, and sent her son. And with her son, these three desks that we're holding up, because uh, Tutu was never about uh, legacy. It was always about practical action. And these are uh, an educational experiment that they've been doing the last five or six years, just before the uh, archbishop died and his family, his daughter and grandson are the main leaders of it of creating these environmental friendly desks that are literally given out for free to students who may have a classroom and certainly will have a teacher, but don't have desks to write on. And with the desk shortage being huge and the need to have something to write on, if you're gonna take notes, they created these easy, free, you know, you can give them out and pass them along from one member of family to the other um, spaces that fit on your lap, but also have all kinds of information. So, you know, whether it's a times table or the ABCs or geography or COVID prevention, uh, these two, two desks are, are part of what his grandson brought talking about the practical realities of the work that continues. Oops, there we go. Um, now, you may recognize some figures here with myself and, and uh, Biso Tutu, Archbishop Tutu's uh, grandson. We have Jihad Abdul Mumit, who will be talking in just a couple of minutes, and Puerto Rican former political prisoner Luis Rosa. And uh, needless to say, we didn't just have Jihad and Luis there uh, to meet uh, Archbishop Tutu's um, grandson or to have, have a time. Uh, you may recognize this woman. Uh, this is a South African former member of parliament, Magdalene Mumsami, who served as the chief jurist in the 2021 International Tribunal of U.S. Human Rights Abuses Against Black, Brown, and Indigenous Peoples. And there's Jihad sitting next to her. The two of them presented uh, at, at a, a major spotlighted plenary session to all of the participants about the tribunal and about the ongoing work and about, of course, the fact that we still charge genocide. And beyond that, that U.S. was uh, now a year and some months ago found guilty of five counts of genocide. So part of the internationalization uh, of the struggle was uh, getting word out about this uh, to 
all the peoples in attendance uh, at these conferences in, uh, in South Sudan and throughout Africa. We also didn't just uh, focus on the tribunal itself, but on colonization in general. And Luis Rosa actually here talking about the situation of Puerto Rico, and you'll see the Puerto Rican flag in the background, um, is one of eight different peoples who have been coming together by Zoom and, and, and virtually over the last three years of a new formation called the Occupy Peoples Network. The Occupy Peoples Network include Puerto Rico, include Western Sahara, include Palestine and West Papua, include Kashmir and Kurdistan Rojava, include Amazonia and Tibet. And for the first time ever, this gathering, and here's the photo of it here, was able to bring together Oh, it says my connection is unstable. I hope you can hear me. Uh, but this, this gathering in Juba, we were able to bring together people from seven of those eight ongoing anti-colonial struggles. The one, those of you who know, I know Edward Hasbrook is here and he will know well, uh, the one that could not get out and come uh, was Kashmir. And we are working overtime to have a, 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 a major conference at the end of 2023, a year from now, that can include the peoples of Kashmir as well. But having, frankly, Tibet, uh, where there is no Tibet passport and, and our Tibetan representative does not travel uh, with a Tibet, you know, with, a, with an Indian passport, uh, they don't, you know, unless you become an Indian citizen, you don't get a, a passport either. Uh, for Luis Rosa and Jihad, you know, it always asks on these visa applications, have you ever been convicted of a crime or did jail time? Well, we knew that we had the connections in South Sudan that these folks would get in. And unfortunately, our Kashmirian comrades could not get out. The last major thing I'll speak of here about our time in Juba is networking. And Pan Pen, uh, and this gentleman in front of me, Moses Monday, the main co-coordinator of uh, these various meetings, a series of meetings, uh, Pan Pen was the Pan-African network that emerged for us uh, most intensely uh, as a potential leading future network to work in. Uh, we had great, um, Great leaders participate with us. This is Ugandan feminist poet Stella Nwanzi, and this is uh, the co-president of Pax Christi International, Sister Teresa, uh, also now part of the Pan Pan Network. And last but not least, uh, after the Juba uh, proceedings were done, uh, I was able to travel another, along with another young comrade, Sienna Mann, uh, to Cabo Verde. We started with Cabo Verde uh, music, so I'm going to end my uh, my presentation just a little bit later than I'd hope to, uh, looking at this time when I was able to fully take off all of my various organizational hats and just be a student again, learning more and digging deep into the legacy of Amokal Cabral. For a number of us, we think Cabral is as relevant as he ever was, as visionary as any African leader of the 20th century, and uh, this, uh, this uh, suggests uh, in a few days in Cabo Verde, the land of his birth, um, he's going to get some honorary degrees. Uh, you know, obviously he was assassinated in 1973, but uh, in his name, uh, his legacy will be continuing to be focused on. Uh, this woman is the head of the Cabral Foundation in the capital of Cabo Verde. The foundation is alive and well and doing good work. Uh, his legacy is uh, essentially alive and well, uh, but uh, there's obviously opposition and the government in Cabo Verde is not the best of friends of, uh, of Amakal Cabral. I was, however, able to meet with some members of his family, this cousin of his that helps look over his birth house, but his birth house is, as this photo might be able to show, in quite a bit of disarray. However, the struggle continues as it does everywhere in all forms and in many forms in the youth. And here I am with a young Cabo Verdean uh, with a poster that gives homage not just to Cabral, 
uh, and there are many posters of Cabral, but there are also many posters of Bibi, of this woman here, who is Cabral's mother. So appropriately in Cabo Verde, like should be everywhere, uh, we're not just honoring some of the men, but many of the women uh, that continue to hold up more than half the sky uh, and, and, and make our liberation movements work. So I will on that note, end my formal presentation. We will take some questions, but before we do that, um, I've asked that uh, my brother Jihad, who was with me for a chunk of that time in, um, in Juba, South Sudan, uh, to give a little bit of his reflections. Of course, the key question I think for all of us that do international work and international travel is, okay, now what? How does that relate to us now? And I'm not gonna say that Jihad has to answer all that questions, but I know he has some thoughts and reflections on all this. My brother, it was so good to be with you in person and it's so good to see you here on the Zoom. I thank you, uh, brother Matt. And assalamu alaikum. Uh, greetings to everyone. <clears throat> Uh, just to be concise, uh, Matt covered uh, uh, the breadth of everything happening and more. So I wanted to, my brief presentation, start off by um, us giving out a salutes to Matt. This was a phenomenal organizing feat. Phenomenal. With the organizations involved, two and a half to three weeks, the coordination of everybody coming in and out of the country, the establishing of the WhatsApp communication, uh, that we had real-time communication with one another, covering for each other security-wise, answering all the questions in real time, uh, making sure all presentations and the flow of the program, the feeding of everybody, the security, and even having a chance to go out and visit certain sites such as the, the White Nile River and, and a couple of other uh, things happening in the community. So, um, uh, Matt, I, I, you have all my admiration and respect, brother. That I was blown away. Uh, about that and organizing the work that goes involved. I know for well, many is, uh, you know, we deal with um, different calls, international calls and things of this nature, but the real work is in the organizing. And I only had one conversation, maybe two with Matt since he's been back. I feel some type of way about that, but we'll talk about that later. But anyway, I um, um, feel jealous you talking to other people. But... Um, <clears throat> I will say in that one conversation, and, and then I'll go on my report, brought up a very interesting point about organizers and the importance of organizers in 2022. This, this organizers, and in, in, um, when uh, Comrade Jalil was talking earlier, when we were viewing the screening of, the, of comrades, myself included, um, grateful for that, about the Black Panther Party. So back then in the 60s, because of the, the, the uh, stature of our, of our movement, the strength of our movement, the personalities from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Malcolm X, to uh, Kwame Torre, to um, uh, Imam Jamil al amin formerly known as H. Rap Brown, to Muhammad Ali, all this going on, you could be an organizer for one year and be enshrined in history forever. Today, you could be working your ass off for 20 years and be not even known. So I salute all the unknown organizers that's 24 seven doing a profound amount of work without any glamor, without any fanfare, who the hell are you anyway, that's been maintaining and sustaining our movement. And Matt Myers is one of them. And I salute each and every one of you for your roles in that also. So I just want to acknowledge that this was not a small deal at all. Um, so, um, yeah, just briefly, the question that Matt left with, I'll pick up with, which I don't expect to be totally answered, even answered at all on this call, but the question is always, where does that leave us as movements here in the United States, including not only the spirit of Mandela, National Jericho, or any other formation that's represented on this call, um, but uh, how do we build our infrastructure to be able to assimilate this because a lot of this information, if not 95%, is coming through Matt. If he drops dead tomorrow, we're we're screwed. You see, this is a this is this. So the few times I had opportunity to go with Paulette to uh the Bas country with Angela, Sister Angela and and to the UN in Switzerland a couple of times to testify there, I realized immediately that coming after that exciting experience and all the people we met come back home, we don't have the infrastructure, the means and the wherewithal to capitalize off of that for one minute. 
we weren't even structured. It was just, oh man, that was deep. And therefore, uh, we are left with the same question, the same challenges as then, now, how do we assimilate this into our processes and our, and our projects moving forward? So that is something that we need to all think about. Don't expect to address that, Matt, but that is the phenomenon. That is the question about how do we, what works for us in our movement, you know, uh, to uh, defeat colonialism here in the United States, for our freedom here in the United States, for our empowerment here in the United States. Um, so I represented the spirit of Mandela. When I went, I represented the National Jericho Movement, and I represented a Muslim community in the United States that you may not be familiar with, but I invest a vast amount of my time with being a Muslim myself, the Jamaat Ufman Denfolio, representing um, uh, the Muslims uh, tradition coming out of West Africa. So I was embraced as a Muslim in a country that separated a lot of that division coming from the Christians fighting the Muslims and the Muslims fighting the Christians. And in spite of the, the, uh, the, the backdrop of all of that, um, Matt and everybody, I felt totally embraced, welcome. The sincerity was real. Only glitch was being detained at the airport for two and a half hours with Luis. Like, okay. And the guy that's detaining us, he fell asleep with his assault rifle right there. I'm like, what the hell? Could you imagine TSA falling asleep? It was such weird. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but um, once we got into it, uh, into uh, the body of the country, and was received uh, by comrades coming from the Archbishop's compound. That was that, but I think a lot of it. I will say, uh, Matt, that uh, Luis and I found out a very important lesson, and I think it's worth just noting 15 seconds here. If you ever go on to the Suhel, if you ever go on to Sub-Saharan Africa, if you ever go into any countries along that belt, and you take American money, don't, don't, don't go to the ATM and get $20 out. You make sure that it's crisp, brand new money because they're building their economy. And they was looking at, they was looking at money that we had to, to finalize our, our, um, our visa like this. And if there's a little ink marks here or this was tattered right there, that's not gonna work. They only want new money. At first I thought it was a thing about them concerned about counterfeit because I was gonna make a sarcastic remark. I said, well, all counterfeit money looks new. <laughs> but, um, but that wasn't it at all. And I found out through uh, sisters and brothers at the compound that they want, when people come into their country, they want new money starting off. They don't want your old crumpled money for whatever reason, but this was it. You'll save yourself hours of agony by not doing what I'm telling you. If you ever go, make sure you go to your bank and you get brand new money unfolded, put it in your suitcase or your carry on and make sure that's what you're working with uh, when you go to places like that. You can sit, you, you, you may not even be able to get through the first door if you don't do that. So that's really heads up stuff. Um, so a few more things. Um, the question is, how do we utilize this information in this vast amount of organizing? I made, uh, and I know this is processes that has to go on with the Spirit of Mandela Coordinating Committee um, as far as that organized body is concerned. Um, you know, with the contact we've made, how that can be utilized to quick pro pro, you know, what they what different movements need from us. Can we deliver? Because they talked about, um, for me, it was not just my presentation about um, uh, the tribunal and the, and, the, and the building of the People's Senate and political prisoners and what we're doing on the ground. And that, it was more so the meetings and the night after dinner, talking to, into the wee hours and hopefully not to get bit by a mosquito, um, you know, just talking and planning. I, I have uh, contacts that I brought back. Matt knows all of these sisters and brothers, but I do want to share them with him. We have not had the opportunity to do that yet and see how um, this can be really richly developed. What role can we play um, in these? So I know Matt mentioning these, things, some of you may know, but admittedly, it took me all the time to be there to really realize what the acronym stood for. So I, if you're hearing this for the first time, God bless you. You're probably in one ear and out the other. Uh, so there you go. Uh, but um, it'll take a minute, but that's gonna be an important minute that you need to take and reread the report that Matt sent out for those that have it. If not, you can reach out to Matt and ask him for it or reach out to any one of us that may already have it. 
to reread that and become acclimated. That's a big thing to become acclimated with the organizations involved, to ask yourself in your own organization, you know, how can we become more fused into these international initiatives? I am in full support of any nonviolent international network being built because that is the same that we're trying to do with the People's Center. We're trying to take organized entities throughout the United States and bring them under the same umbrella. That's what the People Center is about, not to go off into that. And that's what they're trying to do. That's what uh, uh, Onan and, and IPRA and, 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 other, and, and Pan Pan, these organizations are trying to do actually the same thing, you know, on an international scope. And I think it's important that we look at that. And when I say nonviolent, please don't misconstrue that to mean passivity. Because, uh, you know, at one time, it seemed like it was going to bring apartheid down to his knees, even though it seemed like it sprung up again. But... um with boycotts, you know, and Americans, you know, we're very comfortable, uh, you know, like there's no hot water there. What for? Why would you need hot water there? So just little things like that, because it's 90 degrees all the time. Um, it's just a luxury we don't really need. And, and so here we are. So sisters and brothers I talk to are looking at us to be able to see how can the movements in the United States now and with this leverage our influence on the government because they do recognize most of them anyway. America is playing a, a serious role in colonization and the destabilization of governments uh, throughout the continent. They recognize that. Um, but how can we leverage, you know, pressure on, on the United States government moving forward uh, to uh, help in their causes, in their situation, their food, clothing and shelter and water issues that they have there and quick quo pro, how can we elicit support from them when the time comes, you know, for their organizations on their letterheads to send letters and, 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 and uh, representation of our movements here to accentuate what we're doing when those opportunities comes. And everybody was in tune with the need to free political prisoners. That was a, a thread that went through all of the presentations. I have a chance to, to build. Luis and I, Matt, we had a security thing from the time we met in Chicago to the time we separated in, uh, in Addis Ababa, coming back to Ethiopia. It would make sure that we were in each other's presence. We knew each other at the same time. But the fact that we did that, was, and all the time, I realized that um, how many of us really have these connections, working connections with our comrades in Puerto Rico. I'm not talking about just a meeting. Talking about working, come in, can call Oscar right now. You see what I'm saying? You know, so we know each other, but then we really don't. We, we know each other, email, but you never talked to me, have you really? And I've never talked to you, have I really? So it's moving forward, it's just a thing that we have to amp up our game. And I'll close with, once again, I salute Matt Meyer for his stellar work um, internationally. And, and he's definitely tasked with the job of, of breaking down and, and fusing that information down to us so that um, uh, some, the madness never here with us. And one day he won't, like you won't be, real talk. Um, Muslims talk about death all the time. So you need to think about it. And it's just, that's, the, that's, that's life. And it's, it's a good thing that we, we move on and our, we, we embrace our ancestors all the time. So, but while we're here in the living, you know, Matt and everybody to be heads up game about moving forward and assimilating this information. I see Paul Letters telling me to shut up, whatever that means. But my dear brother. Get, just like just like in, in, in Juba, you know, I want to make sure I get my full time to speak every time. <laughs> my dear brother, you. thank you so much. And uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, <laughs> peace and love always. <laughs> um, and, and, not and just a minute. Not, I not was just... waving. Not, I wasn't telling Jihad to be okay. Cool. Paulette, really so there's a list. There's a stack. I, I I right now have Meg on the stack, Paulette next, and then maybe some others after that. Um, I did just want to say, you know, uh, much appreciations. I see a number of questions in the chat and in the meeting. Uh, I just put an answer to one of them to Jaleel, your question, which is a simple one to answer in the chat. Um, I also want to ask all of you, maybe we can go a little bit past six. I wanted to do, um, wanted to do tight, tight one hour, but um, we've gone on as we do. So maybe we can go to, to 6.15 Eastern time. Uh, but right now I'm going to shut up and say, Meg, you're next, Paulette after that. And we'll see, uh, we'll see who's on stack after that. Go ahead, Meg. 
Uh, well, thanks for the presentation and Jihad, thanks for the presentation and appreciation. And it's great to see all of your faces. Um, Matt, when you talked about uh, working with the, the leadership of the South Sudanese and the, the African networks to establish the conference, are there any things that you learned from them in their organizing techniques, in uh, their plans for their countries that you feel are like a particularly important or empowering for us to, uh, for you to convey, convey to us? Um, I'm gonna say something so I don't continue typing. Uh, some of you have said they have to leave in eight minutes. Uh, and this will be uh, hopefully later tonight on the YouTube channel of IPRA and all the proceedings uh, that took place or, or the vast majority of the proceedings that took place in Juba are already up on that channel, including Jihad's amazing presentation where um, he was about to fight like six or seven people there. It was a very dramatic moment where we had to see whether they were gonna have fisticuffs uh, in the, in the, anyway, it was just a jihad being dramatic and, and amazing. You know, Meg, I, I want to hesitate both because I don't want to take up much time, but because in some ways that question is so, so big. Um, yes, there are lots. And I would say, you know, one of the things we're trying to look at in peace studies, but also, you know, it's not peace studies for the sake of theory, it's for the sake of practice, it's for the sake of organization. But looking at indigenous peace building techniques, human rights techniques, communication and justice building techniques seem to be uh, a, vital, a vital part of what is being utilized on the grassroots level by many peoples around the world, including many peoples in Africa. To go into specifics, I, I almost feel like, oh, where do I start and where would I end? Um, but that, that's maybe a, another conversation but the biggest, I guess, uh, the, the reflexive answer, Meg, as soon as I heard you ask that, is that almost everything that you read, including by good U.S. commentators, you know, a comrade of ours, one of you are going to know exactly who I'm talking about and the rest of you won't, but a comrade of ours who was going to come to Juba and didn't, and who was really trying to, in the course of figuring out what their experience might be wrote something about South Sudanese recent history. But ultimately they got it all wrong or mostly wrong. They were very negative or mostly negative. And that happened for one reason and it was the simplest and stupidest reasons of all. They didn't talk to the South Sudanese. And it seems simple, but it's not because we are so rooted in, for some of us of a, of a particular history, but many of us who were born in the US, even if we're not from the white, what used to be called white oppressor nation, right? So we're all rooted in and brought up in white supremacy. Huh? And so, so making it that we, you know, father knows best, we know best, without even just the benefit of asking comrades, what do you think? What's going on? Even when we're talking about and writing about their realities. And, you know, only folks who have been digging deep in international work for a long time have fully, uh, you know, begun the process of, of being careful listeners, of being students, even though a lot of us have white hair and we're elders, um, you know, uh, but we're not, we're not good students and we don't know how to listen well. And there are many, many lessons, I'll just say, Meg, uh, to answer that question um, worth talking about later. Paulette? Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear all of this. And I hope through building our political prisoner network internationally, we're able to um, become part of this grouping uh, that uh, you and Jihad and everybody had a chance to meet. But I was wondering uh, what countries, when you said Eastern Europe, were you talking about, and did you get to go to Turkey or is Turkey included in part of your analysis? Well, I, I was very briefly in Istanbul only. Uh, so it was not really uh, a major part of the stop. I've been to Turkey before and I do have some comments there, uh, but mainly I, I was in Austria, um, Czech Republic, uh, Poland mainly. 
but also in Hungary, briefly in uh, Bratislava, uh, some others maybe. But, you know, to me, Turkey is also, like Syria is also Kurdistan and Rojava. Uh, and the struggles around territory there that are not free. So, um, so Turkey is both the struggle against the, the uh, you know, extremely right-wing leader uh, and, and to be the, the, the secular Muslim society that, that is uh, Turkey in its glory, uh, but also the struggle for, for the freedom of Rojava and that struggle being ra ra waged by many uh, people of Kurdistan, especially very, very strong women uh, freedom fighters who are thinking about a uh, revolution in, in, in many different ways. Um, I know we're going to go over. I know some of you have to leave now. Before I call on the next two people, I see Edward and John Riley. Uh, I just want to say two things briefly before the clock hits six. Uh, for those of you in the New York area, uh, please uh, remember that one week from today, Resistance in Brooklyn has our annual, we've been doing this for more than 30 years, our annual holiday card writing party for political prisons. If you don't know about it, it means you're not on RMB's mailing list. Why on earth would you not be on RMB's mailing list? Send me uh, or someone else you know here your email address and we'll put you on that mailing list right away. And also from an International Peace Research Association perspective, our next big conference is here in Trinidad in May uh, coming up. And, you know, we're still working on who the plenary speakers will be and, and exactly what things will be featured in what ways, but we're well aware that indigenous issues of peace building and justice will be central. Uh, a lot of radicals in Trinidad and Tobago have already, uh, you know, already part of the organizing and we're certain that issues of uh, the U.S. guilty of genocide and, uh, and U.S. political prisoners will be featured there in some major way. So just those little plugs. And now uh, let's see, Edward and then John Riley. Edward, take it away. Thanks. More a comment than a question, but I wanted to reinforce from my own international experience, Matt, something you said early on about uh, the significance uh, and the relationship of anti-authoritarianism to anti-communist feelings in Central and Eastern Europe, because, you know, I think some of you know me as Matt does through the anti-draft movement, but uh, you know my main work over the last 15 years has been with a human rights group focused on freedom of movement. And that's been highly international work that's taken me often to Brussels and Geneva uh, and connected with uh, different kinds of networks and individual anti-authoritarians, many of them from Central and Eastern Europe and post-communist countries. And I think it's important not only to understand that the movement against Stalinism in Europe was driven primarily by anti-authoritarianism and only secondarily, if at all, from anti-socialism. It was not a pro-capitalist movement. It was a movement for freedom and democracy. And they've been telling, being told that freedom and democracy meant capitalism, but really that wasn't their goal. I think it's important to recognize that in our dealings with Europe and European movements and activists. But it's also important to realize that we're in danger of allowing the same dynamic to develop today in China where people are also being told, Chinese people are being told to equate socialism with authoritarianism and to equate freedom with capitalism. So I think there's a big question of what can we learn from the 1989 to 1992 experience in Europe in a way that we can promote an anti-authoritarianism and encourage anti-authoritarian movements in China without falling into the same dynamic of channeling that into capitalism. So those are some thoughts. I really appreciate the work you're doing, Matt. And I also really want to acknowledge that you've come back and reported back to us because so often people go on international junkets and they take the value and keep it in themselves and don't share. So thank you for sharing. 
And let me just say before John Riley goes up, and then I see Ralph and Betty have their hand up as well, that um, you know some of you may know uh, Edward as a draft resistor, or as this is someone may know him uh, for the work he just spoke about, uh, but others uh, will know or recognize uh, Edward Hasbrook is the practical nomad. Uh, he, he's absolutely not only one of my go-to people, and I've been to more places than most people have been to, 107 countries uh, and still counting, but um, Edward's one of my go-to people for, uh, you know, how to get from here to there and, and what's happening here and there. And that was also, I should say, a deep, deep anti-colonial fighter. Uh, he's one of the most consistent and stalwart over decades fighting for the freedom of the people of Kashmir and many other places. And when I, when I look at Kashmir and we look at West Papua, uh, I also failed to mention, I, I had a quick photo of the Palestinian representative in Juba, but he actually was also just elected very happily elected to become the new president of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. So E4 now has a Palestinian president who's part of this Occupy People's Network, which is very exciting. Okay, John, it's all yours now. And then Betty and Ralph after that, and Roberta and Steve after that. Go ahead, John. You froze, Matt. No, I just said, go ahead. Okay, so uh, yeah, the question I had, you know, you you went to Scandinavia, you went to Eastern Europe, and right now there's this horrific war in uh, your sort of general sense of the peace movement there, uh, you know, from afar, you know, thing I've, you know, thing is being recorded. I've recently. Um, uh, interviewed uh, Goran Theraborn, the sociologist, and he was talking about how Sweden had just, like even the Social Democrats, had uh, uh, led the charge to join NATO after two and a half centuries of being non-aligned. So I'm just wondering, is the peace movement just dead because so, um, Putin is so putrid? And uh, they're buying that this is just a uh, defensive war as opposed to, you know, part of an elaborate gunboat strategy to open up Russia and depose the current government for more penetration by the West. Can you talk about that? Is there any rising movement or is it pretty much everybody's neutralized? No, I, look, I would say, again, part of, uh, and, and I'm going to have to give all of these questions, uh, uh, comments are so much easier than questions, but uh, like my response to Meg, I'm going to have to give these questions a little bit of short shrift because I'm aware of the time um, and, and want to hear everyone's comments. But in some ways, these questions to me are our, our homework for 2023. Uh, in other words, going deeper into the two minute answer I'm going to give John going deeper is the homework is our work uh, for the coming period but you know to say briefly yes um the exciting yes that uh, I, I met uh, you know more than a few people uh in all of the different cities in in scandinavia and elsewhere that i went that were as disgusted as anyone would be more probably uh about how the social democrats in sweden you know were becoming cheerleaders for nato etc cetera, etc cetera. so yes um whether I call them, whether I say that any of them got to the point of being uh, peace movements, I, I almost don't know what that phrase means anymore. I know in the U.S. there is no peace movement. I know that just the basic organizations, look, I spent the better part of my 20s and 30s and 40s uh, working a day in and day out for groups like War Sisters League and Fellowship of Reconciliation. Th those two groups that are like sister organizations don't even meet one another anymore much less the Quakers, not to mention the connections that we were building with anti-imperialist and national liberation movements and otherwise. So, you know, is there a peace movement in Europe? I, 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 I'm not gonna say yes, but are there people? Are there people who are making critiques more than a few people who are making these critiques and who are struggling to think about these things in ways that will build, potentially will build, 
movements? Yes, yes. So the question then is, where do we find their comments, their questions? I mean, there are a couple of websites here and there. I've spoken to a few of you that are online now about the websites that are most consistently interesting. Um, so there are some of those websites and probably I know a few, but there are probably a few I don't know. Uh, and there are certainly many individuals in all of those places worth being in touch with as they ask questions and try to build something new in the face of this new phase of imperialism, neoliberalism, colonialism, and capitalism. But uh, movement, I don't know if it's a movement just yet. I think that's in some ways too, uh, maybe a little too optimistic. That's my short answer. Uh, Betty, you. I think you're up next, or is it, it is Betty, right? I mean, it says Betty and yeah. Ralph, and it says Roberta and Steve, but I see you, Betty, so take it away. <laughs> okay. Congratulations, Jihad. Glad to see you got out of the uh, death trap known as the United States. And I appreciate that you're holding your nose and, you know, trying to um, make unity where there is none. And I congratulate you for that. Um, I'm just waiting for the moment when they'll start saying Stalin, um, Castro was Putin and he was a terrible man. And he was- a... No, they say it already. They, yeah. Some of them say it already. And then they'll say, oh, we have to save Cuba from you know these authoritarians. Meanwhile, we're stuck with this idiot after another idiot, one idiot Biden, one idiot Obama, one idiot Trump, and they're all the same. But well, we never noticed that. However, congratulations, I'm glad. And I think we will see a real um, human rights agenda. And so I'm um, looking forward to how this is going to impact in the United States with our political prisoners. Um, but every time somebody says totalitarianism to me, I um, have a recent excuse for wanting to spit. And my most latest excuse for wanting to spit is Kevin Johnson. Um, so when people really want to deal with totalitarianism, I, I hope they'll deal with it at home. Thank you, Sister Betty. Uh, I'm going to pass on to Roberta and Steve in a minute, but I, I, I can't help but, but say this. Uh, you know, I, it was, uh, I won't name names, but it was a U.S. leftist uh, of some renown uh, the last time uh, my family and I, w with my with my kids, we, we were able to go to Cuba not so many years ago. And they're like, oh, man, so bad. You you really, you, it's too bad you, you didn't go back in the good old days. You know, like now things are all horrible. You know, it's like everything has to be good or bad. And, and, and you know, either it's some type of rhetorical perfectionism that someone finds at some moment. Um, we're always good at, at, at criticizing the other. I, I will say, you know, I had some issues with my dear uh, brother, Abby Hoffman, but one of my favorite quotes when he talked about the Democrats and the Republicans was, you know, uh, you're asking me to choose between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. It's like choosing between the evil of two lessers. So I just love that way of, of looking at the uh, so-called two-party system here in the States. Thank you so much. Sister yeah, Bay. your international trip reminded me of me when I stepped out into the movement in the 60s, how many leftist groups I had to go and hold my nose and hold my tongue because I wanted unity. Nothing changes. Dear Roberta and Steve, it's so good to see you always. Uh, for those who don't know, our, our, our dear beloved uh, Brooklyn comrades and neighbors were so sad they're no longer just uh, down the block. Uh, but when I was in um, Washington, D.C. last for the... Uh, anniversary of, of Walter Rodney. Um, there were Roberta and Steve on the screen through the wonders of, of Zoom. So uh, Roberta, Steve, whomever or both of you it is, you've got the floor. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, when you look at what's happening with the China road and belt situation, I'm trying to figure out how, it, it's kind of a complicated question, but how with what's going on with conflicts, within the different nations in Africa, plus the external wars that they are engaging in, how realistic would it be for a one currency, one African currency be to say come to be a reality, whereby as you were saying a while ago, you, you go to one, one, one nation, you have to get one currency, you go to, go to another nation, you have another currency, as opposed to just going there, like let's say with a US dollar or a, a, a euro, 
whereby that currency is recognized by all the nations on the continent. How realistic and do you see that happening anytime soon? Thanks. Let me let me give a, a quick uh, answer to the, the simpler version of that question, um, which is, I think, uh, like all organizing, things have to be done strategically and tactically in stages. Uh, so to me, the stage, the most important stage of that struggle at this moment, the next year or two, is that in French-speaking Africa, especially Francophone West Africa, you have an abomination that a growing number of French-speaking African peoples from a number of countries throughout that region are rising up around. And there are people here in the diaspora, in the States, in New York, and other and and and. and and otherwise, I'm part of several networks, uh, even though my French is not so great. Uh, but, you know, the currency of more than three or four countries in West Africa is not Brazzaville or Togo or Cameroon. It is a unified French West African country com currency completely printed in and controlled by Paris. So the evils of France-Afrique neocolonialism that manifests itself in a number of mainly right-wing, uh, you know, African dictators who are beholden to France is really seeing a tremendous pushback on the continent at this moment. And that currency the French West African unified currency of colonialism and neocolonialism is being deeply fought back against and critiqued now. It seems to me that's the uh, bandwagon, that's the campaign uh, to begin to connect with because even though, uh, again, tactically, uh, it may or may not win, uh, looking at those leaders uh, who are really a, a, a pan-African sub-regional grouping is going to be more beneficial to those of us uh, from the outside uh, than, than calling for a, a full pan-African currency. You know, it's clear also to me, uh, more clear in the pan-African meetings in Juba, that the critiques around the African Union are increasing. Look, there was a time when the Organization of African Union, Un uh, Unity, the OAU, which of course, Minister Malcolm X, Al Haj Malik Al Shabazz, um, you know, patterned the uh, OAAU, the Organization of Afro American Unity, off of uh, as as a unifying space here, uh, you know. But there was a time when the OAU was a space that the frontline states of Tanzania and Zambia uh, and and some other countries, you know, they really looked to support the liberation struggles of the peoples of Mozambique, of Angola, of Guinea Bissau, of uh, you know, it was to become Zimbabwe, and then, of course, the movement against apartheid. But the AU has become more and more a statal body, and more and more a body that has made some, for some of us, unthinkable compromises, like letting Morocco, the colonizers of Western Sahara, into it. So I think the critiques of the African Union, like critiques of the United Nations, is to say, Let's use these massive state-based structures for what we can. The Puerto Ricans give us an incredible learning example of how they use the United Nations Decolonization Committee to help free all their political prisoners, to help raise the issue of decolonization and sovereignty to a higher level. But using those bodies is the same thing as, is a very different thing, very, very different thing than relying upon those bodies uh, thinking that they're going to be the way for global peace or for pan-African unity. Uh, and the same thing, I guess, refers to your question, uh, Steve. Uh, I don't know whether it's tactically yet the time for a big call for a pan-African currency, but I think pan-Africanism, community to community, people's movement to people's movement is right on time. And I think one of the greatest things about Juba is we really began to see some breakthroughs between French-speaking, English-speaking, Arabic-speaking, and of course, indigenous. I mean, one of the many WhatsApp threads that began to become developed uh, was a Kiswahili thread, 
which is not a unifying African language either, but it's still a little bit better than, or at least it, it should have its space on the stage in addition to the uh, languages of, of Europe. So I think we're beginning to see greater levels of peoples to peoples Pan-African unity. Uh, the states, which deal with things like currencies, that may be a, a conversation to come back to a year from now. My dears, it is 6.15 and I definitely feel like I could talk for another hour um, with all of you about any number of topics. I also feel like that would be unfair probably to most of you that have other uh, things that you plan for today. So if I can be allowed, unless someone like, you know, waves their hands wildly and says, I have to make a final comment, uh, seeing no other hands up and no wild wait, wait. waving. Um, oh, okay, Steve, wait, wait, Jaleel you know, is waving. And, you know, Steve said in the chat that Roberta also had a question. Oh, Thank Roberta you. also has a question. All right, <laughs> so you. here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're going to let uh, Roberta go next. We're gonna let Jaleel, uh, you know, bat cleanup as we say in the world of baseball. No, not bat cleanup? Oh, okay. Do you wanna say a one minute thing right now? Okay, he raved his hands, but he uh, he's now just doing the. All right, Roberta, we're gonna let you have the last word, dear. Go ahead, take it away. Yeah, thank you. And I wanted to thank Bob in particular for sending the announcement of your talk today to us. So good to see so many of you who I haven't, who Steve and I have not seen for several years. We miss you. Thank you. My my question kind of ties. Um, what you possibly saw in Eastern Europe with what is now going on in the United States. I remember when, when the um, state government in the GDR was destroyed, that one of the first voices to come out about what that would mean in a negative sense were the women um, who talked about how, you know, with the so-called reunification, there would be a destruction of childcare, there would be a destruction of um, women, reproductive health facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they tied that very much to the state and the nature of the state that would be emerging um, after 1990. And I'm wondering if in um, what you had a chance to see, albeit briefly while you were there, um, there were still voices raised about what was happening with, with women and the rights of women and so forth. And also whether that question of the relationship between the nature of the state and the services that are or not provide, are or are not provided um, for women perhaps uh, has some implications for us here in the United States, especially with the reversals in the Supreme Court um, with, with Roe and also at the level of individual state governments. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, another one of those questions that's gonna require more time <laughs> and more information than I, than I have, but um, you know, th there's no question that these conversations are being had and, and that as we see uh, constraints uh, being placed uh, on all states, uh, all nation states by neoliberalism, by rising right-wing movements uh, everywhere, uh, yeah, and absolutely, especially in Europe. So when I, I talk about good news, uh, like, you know, the good news from the European Peace Research Conference, conference, it's all about good news from the grassroots and not at all about good news uh, on the state level. So, you know, even those countries that had mildly progressive, you know, social democratic states that had good laws for women or, or good laws for workers, uh, you know, or certain good regulations, policies, and services are watching as those things get cut. And, you know, what frustrates me the most, uh, you know, I, I'll take Sweden just a, a, as one example. Um, you know, Sweden uh, has several organizations, peace movement and other organizations, women's rights, 
uh, socialist organizations and some that even call themselves and consider themselves anti-imperialists that fund uh, Polisario, that fund anti-colonial freedom fighter movements around the world, continue to. Um, and then there's an election and a government goes to the right and all of a sudden they have no funding anymore. Oh, sorry, we promised to give you. And there's such a reliance, such a tethering of progressive, I'm not gonna say radical or, or revolutionary, but progressive movements in some of these places on the state, because at one time there was a progressive state, whatever that means, or a socialist or a social democratic state, whatever that means. And, and so no, if there's any lesson to be had, it's a lesson some of us have been talking about, some of you have been talking about before I was born for many, many years, which is tethering ourselves to the states, relying on the states. I mean, not to mention especially the US state. Eh? But when we get upset that liberal reform laws are being taken, that, that may have been positive to women, Roe v. Wade, are being taken away. On the one hand, I, I understand that as deep and real. On the other hand, did we ever think we, whoever the we is, women, certain women, did we ever think we could rely on the US state to protect our rights? Again, I use the word we and our in really big quotation marks. So building people's movements with teeth, as some folks used to say in the George Jackson Brigade, building a movement with teeth, building or rebuilding movements in the 21st century has got to be movements that look much more deeply about our relationship with laws, even state laws. Maybe you have a great mayor and you can have a good law on the books in the city. Don't think that's permanent, you know? So I think if there's any lesson to be learned, it's that even if you have, you know, uh, a, 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 an apparently good government this year or this decade, uh, people's movements are different. And the struggle for uh, people-based democracy, leader, uh, liberation, freedom uh, is very different than what any state I've seen in my lifetime uh, be able to accomplish or achieve. So when we talk about free them all, when we talk about free the land, uh, we're not talking about freeing the land to become another new independent nation state. We're talking about uh, creating freedoms that uh, go beyond what the nation state's been able to do. So for example, when Jaleel Muntakim uh, is going to come to New York City on Tuesday morning at, at 11 a.m. be at Foley Square, uh, as he just put into the chat, um, because of an important New York statewide campaign to end compulsory labor in the penal system, to end official slavery, that is, a, and there are elected officials and, and some you know prominent progressive non-radical lawyers who are gonna be speaking with them. And that's an important campaign to get onto. But if we win, if they win every one of the rights they're looking for at 13 forward, uh, and, and, and we'll have RMB and, and other listservs you know, send you out more information about that. But if they win everything, that's still not ultimate victory. <laughs> that's just one temporary piece of good news. We celebrate every good news we have. If every single political prisoner gets out of jail, we're gonna have victory. But as long as there's capitalism, as long as there's white supremacy, as long as there's patriarchy, there's going to be resistance. And as long as there's resistance, there's gonna be new political prisoners and new battles to be fought. So on that note, free them all, free the land. And please, my dear beloved sisters and brothers and others, Stay healthy and happy and connected and let us rebuild uh, together uh, at the end of this year and the new years to come. Lots of love and solidarity. Free them all. 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 Hi, Larry Giddings. Did everybody see we have our comrade Larry Giddings up hey, there? Listen, listen, I am so, so happy to be here. I got to tell you, this is like all hey, work week for me. <laughs> and you know, man, man, listen, listen, brother, you, you know, you are my man. 
I, I, I dream about being as effective as you are. I have <laughs> paintings that Larry Giddings painted when he was a prisoner, political yes. prisoner, on my wall today. So there it is. Me there too. is continuity. Me there great. is continuity. <laughs> yeah, All right, my dears. Yeah, and and, and, and in addition to guys. Yeah, hi, you know, man. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> here. To Tuesday. You guys uh, have let, all been a part of my life. Everybody here, you know. Listen, we may Every not be together. We may not be together on December 16th, but we better be praying and we better be vigilant and we better be listening because until Matulu is on this side of the walls, we can't celebrate. But once I'm, he is, we got to be celebrating. With, you know, I'm here every day. I make noise in this neighborhood. <laughs> all right, my dears. The struggle continues. Good to see you, Larry. Thank you. Love, Love you, you all. Man. Love you all, man. Thank you, brother. Eddie, man, everybody, man.